Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to, to speak here. Um, so I'm going to talk um, about what's coming up in the next release of Apache Spark, which will be um, release 2.0. Um, and um, before I do that, I'll also give like sort of a, a, a very brief introduction to Apache Spark as a whole. Um, I'm wondering like how, how has, has anyone actually used it before in the audience? Okay, good. So actually a bunch of people have. Okay, so hopefully uh, the introduction doesn't, uh, doesn't like bore people. Um, so, so what is a, Apache Spark? It's basically an open source uh, data processing engine that runs on clusters of machines, and it's a generalization of, of, of Google's MapReduce model. It has, you know, same kind of characteristics in terms of fault tolerance and things like that, but it can support more types of applications. The, the project actually started as a research project at UC Berkeley before moving to the Apache uh, Software Foundation. And apart from the, um, the, the, the engine itself, it's also a pretty large set of libraries, uh, including APIs in different languages. We don't have Julia, unfortunately, as one of the built-in languages yet, but maybe in the future. Um, uh, but, and, and also uh, libraries for streaming, SQL, data frames, machine learning, and, and other stuff. Um, and since the project began, it's grown into a pretty large community. So we've counted over a thousand deployments. The largest cluster that someone has, uh, you know, has like kind of publicly talked about is um, is eight thousand nodes, and also over a thousand people have contributed code to the project. Um, so just to very briefly say how the programming model works because before I jump into things that are new, uh, the, the key idea in Spark is that you write programs in terms of these uh, pretty simple transformations on distributed data sets. And you work with a big distributed collection of objects as if it were an array of objects in your local program or something like that. But you can do all these operations on it in parallel. And uh, in Spark, these, these collections are called Resilient Distributed Data Sets, or RDDs. Not exactly the easiest name, unfortunately, but that's, you know, <laughs> that's, that's what we called it. Um, and basically, uh, these are just collections of, uh, of objects stored in memory or on disk across a cluster. If you're working in Python, they're Python objects. If you're working in Java, they're Java objects, and so on. So they're just your standard objects. And you build these using parallel transformations, such as map, or filter, or reduce. Um, and they also automatically recover on failure. That's the resilient part. So as a really, really um, kind of simple example of the API, here's you know, some code I'm going to show in Python, where we lo load a large log file, uh, which is a bunch of text into memory, then search for various patterns. Um, so we have a cluster here with a, a master node called the driver and a bunch of workers. Sorry if some of them are a little blurry. Um, and um, here's some code you can type in. You can actually type this code interactively at the Python shell. Um, so first you can say, okay, let's, uh, let's load a text file from the Hadoop distributed file system. This gives us a base RDD, which is a, a collection of strings, um, one for each line of text in the file. Um, and then after that, you can do transformations on it. Um, so for example, you can say, let's pull out only the error messages in the log. So let's pull out only things that start with error. And uh, you can just pass in a Python function, or I, I passed in a Lambda here, but you can also just pass in you know, the name of a function in your program, and Spark will take it and run it on the cluster. And uh, this gives you a, a transformed uh, data set or RDD. Um, and then you can do other stuff, you know, maybe these are tab separated fields and you want to pull out field number two, which is the message, so you can just do that. Um, and then you can cache some of the data sets in memory. So here, we're just going to keep the error messages in memory. We're not going to keep the original file, you know, maybe it's too big. Um, and basically, the, the Spark API executes um, in, in a lazy fashion. So um, up to this point, it's just kind of remembered all the operations you did. And you run a different type of operation called an action to actually kick off a computation. And when you do, it tries to optimize across all the previous steps as well as it can. Um, so here, for example, we're going to count how many errors contain my SQL. And then Spark will look at all the things before, and we'll come up with a good plan to execute this. Um, so it's going to look at where the data is located on the cluster. It will send tasks to process each block of data. It will get back results. And it will also build up these caches of the in-memory data, the messages here. 
Um, and then next time you run a query, you know, maybe MySQL wasn't the problem. Maybe we search for PHP in the log instead. Um, it's going to actually use the cache because it remembers that it's built this before. Um, and of course, you can do all kinds of other stuff, not just filters and counts. Um, so just as an you know, example of what you can do, one of the demos of it we do is just full text search of Wikipedia. It, it's not a huge data set, but it's about 60 gigabytes. So it would take a while to run like off the disk on your laptop. Uh, and even off of memory, actually, it would take a while to run. Um, but in a, in a cluster of nodes using even just Python, you can do this full text search in about half a second. Um, and um, uh, you, you know, and it also quite a bit faster than disk. And you can also scale this up to much larger data sets and just kind of type Python code or Java code and, um, and run it on there. OK, so that's, that's kind of a brief. You know, if you haven't seen it, that's kind of what it lets you do. Um, no changes to Python and Java. You just run your existing ones. Um, and then the second part of the project that's like really where most of the development is happening is actually the libraries. So we have a bunch of libraries built on the same um, core programming model. And uh, these libraries are all designed to interoperate together. And they're also designed to, uh, to just give higher level interfaces. A lot of them are actually designed to look very similar to single machine tools. So for example, for working with structured data, um, which ties in very well with, uh, with what Jeff shows in, showed in his talk, we have the Spark SQL package and data frames. And these are a similar interface to our data frames and pandas and Python and stuff like that. And they do a lot of um, you know, powerful optimizations underneath in, in terms of how to store the data and how to manipulate it. So if you know how to use pandas, you know, for example, in Python, this is a distributed version of pandas. And actually, this move towards these kind of structured interfaces is, uh, you know, it, it was really uh, one of the biggest moves in the past few years. Um, and it's actually really cool to see that, you know, other, like many other systems are moving um, in this direction as well. It's, it's, I think it's a good thing if more people do it. Um, so that's, that's the data frame side. Uh, the machine learning side is modeled after scikit-learn. You can build pipelines and train the whole pipeline and, and things like that. Um, the graph side is modeled after graph lab. So all of these are, are meant to look similar to kind of single machine or, or sort of smaller data tools. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what it provides. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to show about the project, which, which I thought was pretty cool, is what people um, are using to, to program Spark. And this is something that's actually evolved a bunch in the past um, few years, and it's, it's still changing pretty fast. So when the project started out, it was really targeted more at software engineers who were using Java and Scala and these, these, these kind of statically typed languages, and because that's also what all, all the original MapReduce uh, interfaces were from. Um, and then we added the uh, Python API um, actually back in 2012, and we added R last year. And recently, we've really seen a shift with uh, much more use of it in, in just kind of data science, where you use uh, these sort of higher level scripting languages. You tend to use just the libraries directly or something like data frames, and you don't sit down and write a lot of map functions and reduce functions. Um, and that's pretty cool to see, because it means a uh, much, much wider set of users are, are, are using um, uh, Spark. So these two in, in particular, Python and R, have been going uh, pretty fast. And I, I think pretty soon, actually, uh, like at, at Databricks, uh, which is the company I'm involved in, we actually see more Python than, than any other language among our um, users. OK, so that's a really brief overview of the project. So um, in the next you know, part of the talk, I want to talk about what's coming up next, which is release 2.0. Um, so this is the next major release of Apache Spark. It's actually uh, aimed to come around the end of May. You know, if it slips a little, it, 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 depending on whatever things need to be fixed, it might be, a, um, you know, in the beginning of June. Um, and it's been in development for the past uh, four months. So we actually have a pretty fast release cycle, uh, and we try to, you know, to, to, to deliver features quickly rather than taking, you know, a year to put something out. Um, and um, it, even though it's 2.0, which is a major release version, it aims to stay very compatible with Spark 1.x. Um, so there are some things that break compatibility slightly. They're mostly uh, to reduce binary dependencies on libraries that we don't really uh, want to depend on. So uh, for example, in the Java API, we depended on um, something called Guava, which is a collections library from Google uh, to implement things like options. And now Java has its own options. And 
and uh, basically it's, it's easier to drop that. Um, so, but, but most applications should not have to change very much to, to switch to this. Um, you know, you may have to recompile, for example. Um, so that's, that's currently the plan. Um, and there, there are basically changes throughout the engine in this release, throughout the libraries as well. Um, but I've put together sort of a list of, uh, of the major features. And basically, I want to um, talk about uh, three of them here. Um, so the first one is a continued effort called Project Tungsten, which is to speed up um, especially the structured data APIs in Spark, but also other ones, by doing things like uh, code generation, uh, better in-memory storage layout, and so on for structured data. This is actually very similar to some of the optimizations Jeff talked about for um, structured data in, uh, in Julia. Um, so we, we make this available under all the, the, the programming languages in Spark. Um, the second one is Structured Streaming, which is a new higher level streaming API. This does some pretty cool things. Basically, it takes a data frame API and gives you that for streaming data. So you can have essentially an infinite uh, data frame and do stuff with it. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and the final thing is machine learning um, uh, model export. Actually, I'm not going to have too much detail on this, but the idea there is once you've built a uh, machine learning pipeline with many steps, you can export it and load it back into a program later and use it to serve results in a production application. So that's a pretty useful thing once you've actually trained your, uh, your model. Um, so I'm going to jump into, um, into this one uh, first. So uh, what, what exactly is this, the, this kind of project tungsten? Um, basically, what we noticed is um, you know, the, the, when we started uh, Apache Spark, actually, uh, cluster computing was pretty much entirely I.O. bound. You just, the, the name of the game was just avoid network I.O. and then also avoid disk I.O. These were the two most expensive things. Um, but in the five years um, since then, um, I.O. has gotten a lot faster. It's still the bottleneck if you, uh, you know, if you, if you use everything efficiently, but it's definitely gotten faster. Uh, but CPU speeds have not kept up as much. And even when you add enough, when you add more cores, the, the number of those ha hasn't grown fast enough. So basically, a lot of big data workloads, not just Spark, but, but many things out there, are now CPU bound. And especially if you're working in something like Java and Python, it's really hard to make CPU efficient code come out of that because it's such a high level language. Um, so with uh, Project Tungsten, we want to bring Spark closer to bare metal for a lot of the computations people care about um, through native code, uh, th th sorry, through native memory management and runtime code generation. And we do this under some of the higher level APIs. We can't just take like your Python function and uh, turn it into super efficient code because that's pretty hard. But we can take your data set, uh, sorry, your data frame or um, machine learning pipeline and try to optimize across that. Um, so basically, if you use the data frame or the SQL API in Spark, you'll get these optimizations. Uh, there's also an interface called Dataset, which lets you mix uh, more easily kind of Java and Python with some of these um, structured operations. Um, and in 2.0, we have two things that really speed up these things. Um, one is whole stage code generation. Um, so this is when you use an expression with multiple operators, like uh, you, know, you do a map and then a group by and a reduce. Um, we generate a piece of code that does all of those together. And that just becomes like a single loop over the data where you know, we, uh, we, we compute whatever result. Um, so we fuse together the work across different operators. And that gives a really large speed up, especially in more complicated programs um, uh, as much as a factor of 10 speed up in some of the ones we looked at. Um, and then the second thing we have uh, is uh, really optimized input and output um, from, um, from Parquet, which is a, a patchy columnar um, a data format that's very commonly used on these large clusters. So um, it's, uh, it's a lot faster than, for example, going through the Parquet uh, Hadoop plugin, which is what we did before. Um, and that can also give a speed up uh, on the I.O. part. So the nice thing about these is you don't have to do anything special to use them. If you use SQL and data frames, you automatically get these things, and, and they're on by default in 2.0. Uh, so that's, that's basically that. Um, and then the second thing I'll talk about is, um, is structured streaming. Um, so this is the uh, you know, higher level stream processing engine. This is much earlier on, but it's a, uh, it's a thing that we're putting out and trying to get feedback on. 
So this is a higher level streaming API built on the same engine as Spark SQL and DataFrame. So it's designed for structured data where you tell us the schema, uh, you won't be able to put in like any random Java or Python object, but it's still pretty powerful for a lot of applications. Um, and um, it, it supports uh, a lot of kind of more advanced uh, stream processing features like event time, which means your data can come in with a timestamp from outside and it can be out of order and you can do stuff like group by that timestamp and, and, and produce historically accurate results. Um, different windowing modes, sessions, and also a pluggable way to put in sources and sinks. Um, but the other thing that it does that's pretty unique is um, on the same data that's coming in as a stream, you can also do interactive and batch queries. And this is what we see is, you know, is very common in most applications using streaming. No one has just a stream of data and then they want to run a map function on it and they say, okay, that's it. We, we passed everything through a function. Really what they want to do is, you know, they want to compute some state and then be able to serve queries in some kind of application, like a web application with a UI and someone sitting there and drilling down. Um, or they want to, you know, say, train a machine learning model and then update it or apply it to a stream. Um, or they, some, some people even want to change the streaming queries at runtime, like put in a new filter and start computing a new aggregate. Um, and these things have been pretty difficult to do with just pure streaming APIs, including the Spark streaming, the initial one. Uh, but there's nothing stopping the engine from doing them because it can already do interactive and batch stuff, as I showed. So we're designing this um, structured streaming to, to let you do these things as well. So for example, you can view each stream as a SQL table and just connect using JDBC and do SQL queries on it. Um, and we're also planning integrations with the uh, machine learning library uh, to let all the models there work in it as well. Uh, so basically the name we're using for this is we don't just want to do streaming, we're looking at continuous applications, which is an entire application uh, where data comes in continuously, but there are more things. It's not just a single uh, computation you do once. So that's, that's the goal with this. Now that's a fairly big goal. It's not going to have all of this in 2.0, but it will have the kind of the beginnings of it. Um, the second thing that we wanted to do with structured streaming is to have a really nice API. It's actually really hard to reason about streaming, especially when you get to stuff such as out of order data. You know, what does it mean if I, I told it to, uh, you know, to, to, to compute like, you know, a sum of things by hour and then like some events are late and, you know, now my old sum has to change or stuff like that. So that's, that's pretty complicated. And basically the idea here has been, let's try to make the stream API the same as Spark's batch API. Um, so the idea is the, the simplest way you know, you, to do streaming analytics is not having to reason about the streaming part at all. If you understand how a batch program works and what it computes, you should be able to compute that, but in a streaming fashion. So let me talk a little bit about what that means. Um, so basically in, in Spark you know, 1.x, uh, we had this, uh, this API for data frames or tables if you use SQL, whatever you want to use it. And a data frame is just a finite collection of data. And then you could do different things on it like group by, uh, you know, sum, average, count, all these operations you do on it that, that are essentially some kind of query. Um, so in Spark 2.0, we, we have infinite data frames. So basically these data frames can grow over time and whatever computation you registered on a data frame, like say you took it and you wanted to compute the sum of everything, um, you can make that run as a streaming job on the infinite one. And what we'll do is we'll update the result incrementally as new, result, as new records come in. Uh, you, you know, you control kind of when that happens, but that's, that's what we'll do. So basically it's the same API to do these two things. Um, okay, so I'll show a really brief example of how to use that. So this is an example where um, we are doing some aggregation with just batch processing using the data frame API. Um, so uh, basically, uh, actually this is also showing some of the data sources in Spark. Um, so we read a JSON file that's in Amazon S3 um, and actually Spark will infer the schema and figure out you know, what fields are in your JSON, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, and then we say, okay, let's group by user ID an hour and figure out the average latency from these logs and let's save it to MySQL. Um, so that's, uh, you know, and again, it understands MySQL and you know, can write a table into it. Um, so that's pretty nice as a batch job. It's pretty clear what it does. You know, it's just gonna open the file and compute these counts and put it in there. 
Um, but what if this S3 bucket is actually a place where we're dropping in new files like every minute or uh, you know, ev even every few seconds? Um, and we actually want to maintain these counts in a streaming fashion. So using some, some kind of separate streaming system today, you'd have to write a job that you know, reads the stream from there. Uh, and then it would need to talk to MySQL somehow and make sure you're doing everything as a transaction in MySQL so you don't write like half the data and then crash and then get lost about where you were. And you know, there's a bunch of work required to get this to happen reliably. Um, using uh, structured streaming, um, it's just changing a couple of the, um, of the API calls here. So instead of saying just open one file, we'll say, okay, let's stream all the files that arrive in this S3 bucket. And instead of saying write once, we're going to say start a stream that updates MySQL. And um, structured streaming understands um, uh, you know, a bucket in S3 as an input source, so it knows how to watch it and find new files and, and track which ones it's processed. Um, and it also understands MySQL as a sync. So this isn't just like a thing we write once. This is actually a table in MySQL that we keep up to date as new records arrive. Um, so for example, when new data comes into this bucket, even if it's for a previous hour or like a user ID who hasn't done anything in a while, uh, we're going to actually update the appropriate row in that table. And the result of this program is going to be the same at all times as if we just ran the batch program at, at the current instant in time on all the data. Um, but it's going to do it incrementally. So that's, that's kind of the idea. And this, this uh, incremental execution is done automatically by the Spark engine. As long as you're, it understands the, the operators you've used in your program, you know, if it doesn't know how to incrementalize them, then it will also tell you that. But basically, you know, if we had a batch plan, we can create a continuous plan that knows how to update stuff and, uh, and do it in an in a, in a incremental way. Um, so this is, you know, this is a pretty cool feature. The, the first version of this is going to have, you know, it's not going to support every single operator, but uh, we've designed it and, and over the next few releases we'll try to do many of them. And it will support the use case I showed before, which is just kind of aggregating data from, uh, from something like Amazon S3. Okay. So that's you know that's that's basically you know the 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 the, the two kind of features I wanted to jump into um, in detail because I, I I don't have like a, a enormous amount of time. So just to summarize, basically, um, um, Apache Spark aims to provide high-level APIs for data processing that will work with any scale of data. And a major move recently that's continued by these two things is to integrate it very well with kind of small data libraries and APIs such as Python, R, and and data frames and so on. And I think both the, the project Tungsten work, which does a lot of powerful uh, kind of database-like optimization under these APIs, and the streaming work, which, uh, which makes them incremental, are actually pretty new things in Spark. No, no other data frame um, implementation does these things. But it shows that it's possible to do a lot of stuff under these existing things that people um, are already very familiar with. Uh, so we're hoping to continue that um, in future releases. Um, and one final thing, one, one kind of company slide, if you want to learn Apache Spark, uh, I also want to say that Databricks offers a, a free environment with um, tutorials where you can launch like a mini Spark cluster and actually work on stuff and, and work on kind of real data there. So I definitely encourage you um, to check that out as well. Okay, thanks. <laughs>